May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, preserving the legacy of Shinju Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today we have a guest, Howard Klein, who uh, everybody calls Howie. Howie showed up around the Zen Center in... uh, the early 70s, he was a cool guy, got to know him, and uh, he was around there a while, and uh, then uh, he um, he went to study with Trunkpa. He came from uh, Millbrook. Uh, maybe he wasn't, didn't come immediately from Millbrook, but it was uh, because of uh, his... Uh, a friendship with Alan Marlowe and Diane DePrima, who were at Millbrook. You know, Millbrook's where Timothy Leary and Richard Albert lived, and it was, uh, you know, a sort of LSD uh, community on the East Coast, um, started by those Harvard guys uh, who were experimenting with uh, LSD and, uh, you know, the university um, finally frowned on it. And uh, so anyway, he came out there and he talks about that stuff. And we reminisce a little about some uh, characters uh, from that era. And uh, anyway, it's a real pleasure to talk to Howie. And uh, I think you'll enjoy uh, hearing what he has to say. And uh, so uh, we'll give him a call uh, just as soon as We've had our pause to meditate. So when you hear the bell, hit pause if you're of such a mind uh, and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're through and then you have the proper state of mind to continue, hit unpause and we'll hit the bell to end the meditation and give Howie a call. Uh, you don't want to call too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, Howie. Hey, David. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly 7 p.m. your time. It's 7. Well, what time is it really there? Here? It's 10 in the morning. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I can report that uh, Sunday is a good day. You you uh, you have something to look forward to. Is that right? Why is that? Well, because I'm experiencing it and I'm reporting back to you what it. Oh, will you're be ahead like. of us. I see what you're saying. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I I had a sex dream last night. Uh, oddly oh. Enough. Please, please. But I won't go into it. it it's. <laughs> It's something yeah, I don't I can think understand. about at all. I yeah. think, but it was kind of amazing. For, really? Uh, my age. Yeah. Well, how old are you? Well, in about two weeks, I will be 80 years old. Wow. Well, 
Yeah, that's good. So um, I'll follow you in two and a half years. All right. Well, we'll uh, I'll be waiting somewhere, either here or there. Uh -huh. Right, right. Yeah, you might like it here. But I don't know. You got it pretty good there. It's You're in a nice place. Yeah, well, I've turned down a couple of senior housing opportunities because I just have too much stuff to get rid of. And I like it here, and she's not kicking me out yet. Right. Guerneville is, it's, you know, it's almost like an anachronism. It's, uh, it's really a nice sort of out of the way place there. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. It's very countrified. I spend my time working in the garden. Yeah. I'm like Chauncey Gardner at this point. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, hmm. So what What else are you up to? I, I want to hear you. Well, I, I think I told you last time I'm, I have, have had some neurological problems. Uh, I've been to the um, emergency room. I've had episodes. I haven't had one uh, yeah, uh, since April 27th was my last one. I stopped mm -hmm. smoking dope and stopped drinking wine. I don't know if that added to it. But uh, mm -hmm. they called it uh, global transient amnesia um, just because they couldn't figure out what it was. Um, and I, you know, <laughs> when I was, in, I was at the emergency room for about six hours, I have no memory of what went down. Yeah. And even before that, I've, I don't go to Santa Rosa very much. I've forgotten how to get places. My memory, I don't know, uh, they gave me an EEG recently uh, and... They didn't say that I have uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, but something has uh, happened with my brain. Yeah, uh, you clearly don't have dementia, Howie. Well, they gave That's me all different. these tests. They gave me five words, and then I had to repeat them a couple of minutes later, and then they showed me a clock, uh, and they said, uh, put the uh, hands at 10 to 11, and then they showed me a rhinoceros and an elephant, and I said, oh, it's a rhinoceros. I said, do people really get this wrong? She said, some people think it's a cat or a dog. So I said, oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. Um, hey, you ought to read up on uh, Oliver Sacks. Have you ever read his stuff? I've heard of Yeah, I remember him. Uh, he, he wrote uh, wonderful books on uh, mm, really unusual reactions to Maybe neurological damage. Most of his people were, were brain tumors. Uh, uh -huh. Are uh, some are uh, you know just them? He wrote a book, "The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat." For a hat, yeah, I remember that. People who whose memory shut off at a certain point, like there's one guy uh, getting off the boat coming back from World War II, a soldier. After that, he didn't create new memories after some instant there walking off the boat. And yet, he didn't realize there was anything wrong with him. And, you know, he had a wife who had to deal with it. And these people, several of these people would have the most extreme things. And several of them, their wives would go with them to a doctor and they'd say to the doctor, well, my wife thinks I've got a problem. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> it was really. <laughs> Really great reading. Um, so, uh, but, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I hope that works out. But um, I I can sort of understand it a little bit. I mean, in that, um, I, and I've, I've had a, a slight problem, uh, and, it, and it gets worse as I get older, of... Uh, like I'll I'll be wanting to say San Francisco and I'll say uh, you know Santa Rosa, or uh -huh. I'll say just enough and or I'll say uh, and, and and what it is uh, I I tell Katrinka it 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 like I'll, I'll my my mind will want to be saying a word and so it goes to the folder that has that category of word and that's as close as I can get right, right. I just pick one out. <laughs> well, I have older and, friends now, even people in their 60s that, you know, have 
memory things uh, like you know I wa- they'll walk in the kitchen and they're not sure why they're there and then they'll have to walk back and see what it is they were looking for you know well that's pretty common yeah uh, right um, i mean that happens to you when you're younger but uh you know as people get older there's that things like that tend to be more ken sawyer was just i mean i was working with ken I, he must have still been in his 20s and he just couldn't remember anything. And we were working in the, the bullpens at Green Gulch, way up the end of the valley. And he'd go down, you know, a couple hundred yards to the shop. And he'd get there and he couldn't remember uh, <laughs> what he came for. And then he'd go back and he'd realize he'd left his tape measure there. And he'd go, oh, yeah, this is what I need. And he was always doing He got checked out for uh, early onset dementia, you know, maybe like 20 years ago, they said, no, you're fine. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Well, I've known people over the years, who, you know, space cases, as we used to say, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but like, we, we, we know some people who had dementia. Yvonne got dementia. She had an awfully benign dementia. Who was this? She just, Yvonne Rand. Oh, yeah, she, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she just became nicer and sweeter, all peace loved up. She had a, she had a sort of clarity in it, uh, and said very wise things, you know, right up to the very end. Uh, but, uh, you know, Yvonne was a very definite, uh, person before this came in. I mean, you know, and, and she, uh, she was she could be very hard on people. She could be judgmental. She could yeah, be Yeah, I kind of remember. She had a daughter, firm. Hillary, right? Hillary, right. And uh, if Yvonne lived with Bill up in Fido is where they... You know, and as, she, as, as her dementia set in, you know, I'd call her now and then and talk to her. She just... All that, that hard part of her just fell away. It was just all peace and love and right sweet. On. Now, Silas... Uh, has dementia. I just talked to him. I talked to him through Bill Porter. Uh, Bill Bill goes for a walk with him every two weeks. And, uh-huh. you know, Silas, you know, he remembers who I am. I, I've talked to him a year ago and two years ago. It, his has been coming on slowly. But when I talk to Silas, I don't know what he's saying now. Uh-huh. Uh, I just talked to him and and respond every once in a while I'll get some key concept and just say a little something but there's still feeling and warmth going back and forth George Wheelwright who we got Green Gulch Farm from uh, I used to talk to him a lot and as he got into I mean at 80 he was still doing he was still being flown in a helicopter that to the top of mountains to lead a group skiing down wow. and stuff. But he, he told me, I was walking with him in the fields, and he said, oh, God, man, it's just all the aches and pains are getting older. <laughs> uh, I think you got to be careful about about too much running and skiing and stuff, you know. Yeah, uh, I think I ruined my knees by sitting on a cushion. Uh, I don't know for sure, but... Walking around the block is a little tough. My knees are not in great shape nowadays, but lately I hear that they're better. Uh, you know, walking around the block. But um, so um, I, I was. Wait a minute! I, wait a minute! I want I want to comment on that. I I'm sitting with my legs crossed now, and I don't have knee problems. You and still I, sit I, on a zafu? Yeah. Oh wow! I mean, I'm sitting. I'm not. Like this morning, I sat and I sat in half lotus, uh, and I'll sit like an hour or something. It, I don't have a problem with me. I I pay attention. Uh, I sat full lotus, both types, until wow. I don't know. I was in my thirties. I started feeling a pain in my knee, and you know, there's all these people with knee problems even back then at Zen Center and getting operations, and I stopped sitting up a full lotus. And um, anyway, I mean, so I, I, I might know. have tried full lotus. I never used it as a as a means. I or just sat on a zafu or on a gomden, which was uh, the square thing that we used in Boulder. Uh, right. Just cross legged, but now I sit on a chair. Uh, right. Right. I have to 
that's it. So I, I was uh, I had a dream the other day about 150 Laguna Street, which was like the first place that I lived after you know Alan Marlowe invited me to the Zen Center. Uh, and was, give me a year. Give me a year. Um, I think it was. Um, let's see. I can tell you. I think around 1973. Two. Two or three. Well, no, I think I, well, it could be two, but I think it was three. Uh, All right. My, see, my connection was Alan Marlowe and Diane. Okay. Because uh, okay. they were uh, part of Millbrook, and they were also used to come to this ashram that I lived at before Millbrook. So, um, so wait I, a minute. What, what ashram? You got to tell me what It ashram. was Ananda Ashram in Monroe, New York, and the teacher was Ramurti Sriram Mishra, Dr. Mishra. Oh, he yeah. A, I remember you talking about him. He was a medical doctor mm -hmm. and, a, and a guru. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ananda, that was my first. Um, I used to go to the, um, uh, the, the center on 72nd Street in New York. And then I found out they had a thing upstate, you know, that I sort of graduated to sort of going up there and practicing and then I actually became part of that community. I sort of moved there. Mm. And uh, so there was this guy, Bill Haynes, who was the director of the ashram, and there was Dr. Mishra. And uh, there was uh, one of the Holy Mothers. I forget her name. I think she just died. But um, so that was my first uh, spiritual connection. Uh, uh, be, you know, because uh, initially it was... Um, you know, smoking pot and taking peyote and, and taking sugar cubes that got me started, you know, back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we have this connection with, you know, Diane Goldschlag. Uh, That's right. My first wife. You're the only person I know who knew her back in the Bronx. And I was thinking, you know, to, to use the term, she was the real teeny bopper. You know, <laughs> I remember going up to her apartment. She lived above the handball courts where we used to play. And I remember, you know, she was smoking a pipe. And we I think we smoked dope together and uh, hung out a little bit, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. She was and eccentric. Then, she was far out and eccentric when she, when she was a teenager because she would tell me things about her. And she was. Really, an unusual person. Yeah, she We're probably gone. was into poetry and you know all the hip things back then. I don't know if she's into jazz or what, but you know. Yeah, yeah, and she traveled to Europe and and you know, uh, uh, in Germany, she stayed with a, a a family and she's in their attic and she finds all this Nazi stuff from the the past and wow. Uh, then she traveled in the Middle East as a German. It's really? in Syria. It's in Syria, right? And uh, and then she went uh, and Israel was on a kibbutz, and she was sitting on a sand dune, and she said, "There's there's this whizzing sound. People came get get out, come come on, come on. Those are bullets." <laughs> wow! Wow! Yeah. Uh, anyway, and uh, she's so, the mother of your son, right? Yeah, yeah she and I son. were well. We have the first son. Uh, she and I were together for eight years, and we were married, you know, uh, and uh, uh, by Richard Baker in the city center. You you might have even come. I 73. might have. Uh, and, um, yeah, Kelly is our son, and he lives in Spokane, where she lives, and she has a little Zen group there. Oh, she's still around? Yeah. Oh, cool. She has a, she has a Zen group in Spokane. Oh, wow. Wow. I didn't know that. I wondered what happened to her. Yeah. She's going strong, man. She's married to uh, a guy who was, uh, he's probably retired for a service and they live, they have a, a house, beautiful house in the woods and she kept her house in the city and she's still a very high end, expensive body worker. Wow. She's been doing does she, body does she work have any forever. other children? No. Uh -huh. No, they got together. They got together when she was older. You know, uh -huh. they've been together twenty years or something. I don't so, know. what is she in her seventies? Yeah, she's only. I'm seventy-seven. She's probably seventy-five. Wow. 
four or five. So she's born in the late 40s. Yeah, well, she'd no, not late. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yes. Probably, she was probably born in 47, 48, just mm. like Katrinka. Right. Uh, uh, maybe Daya, Daya, you know, she's Daya Goldschlag. She's been Daya for yeah, I remember four, that. Yeah, thirty-five years or something. Uh, maybe she's only a year and a half younger than me, and Katrinka's two and a half years younger. So uh, you're what, nineteen forty-five? Yeah. 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 Uh, but wait, so you arrive in San Francisco uh, at the bequest of. Uh, Alan Marlowe and Diane DePrima, uh, because you knew them from Millbrook. Uh, can you tell us a little Millbrook uh, uh, memory? Yeah, well, um, we, at, at the ashram that we were living at, uh, you know, it was a pretty straight place, and we, you know, we did yoga and hatha yoga and we, mantra, and somebody brought some uh, psychedelics into the ashram, and we all started tripping, and... Um, they found the uh, yoga society said, you people have to leave. You know, you're doing illegal drugs. So Alan and Diane went to Tim. Wait, wait. They, I bet they weren't illegal yet. They were illegal. Oh, really? Well, back in, the, in, in like 66. What was it? Well, marijuana was. No, but, but we were so doing I, acid. The acid was not illegal then. Well, we got acid. busted anyway. They they thought it was illegal. However it was, they said, you people got to go. Yeah. And so they, Diane and Alan went to Tim, and they said, there's a bunch of people, a community. And he was trying to legalize LSD. He, he had a religion called the League for Spiritual Discovery that he was trying to uh, 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 promote. So he wanted different groups living at his uh, property. So he invited us all to move there. So we moved there in the 66 or 67. And, uh, you know, we used to, people used to come up there like the Grateful Dead would come out. And Millbrook was owned by this millionaire, uh, Billy Hitchcock, the Hitchcock yeah. Mellon Bank family. And they had a, a big bungalow, bungalow bill, they had a big bungalow on the property uh, away from the main house where we lived with Tim, you know, and we, we would have sessions like uh, sometimes with Tim, sometimes with ourselves, where we would all be in this big room and they would, you know, we would drop whatever it was. We would, be, I forget the form, it was probably a pill at that point. Uh, and we would have these LSD sessions where, you know, there were various themes that would go on there. Uh, and then, you know, we had sort of people would come up like Allen Ginsberg and uh, some the Grateful Dead showed up there one day. And uh, Stanley Owsley, who was uh, one of the big acid manufacturers, uh, yeah. was, just showed up there. And Nick wow. Sands was another guy. There was actually a, a great video on, on um, Netflix on um, Orange Sunshine, which was his big product, you know, at that point. So we lived there for a number of years, and th there was a guy who was the head of my community. He was a, an older guy, so he was probably in his 30s at that point. His name was Bill Haynes, and he was sort of like, you know, the, the big kahuna of our group. And at some point, um, I think he got into a thing with Tim or got into some kind of a power struggle. And so we were we were kicked out of Millbrook. Uh, oh, the ashram. And so uh, we we had uh, a patron, a, a millionaire uh, who bought a, a piece of land in Arizona, uh, outside of Benson, Arizona, outside of Tucson. Um, and so we all moved to the desert and we set up an ashram out there. But we continued to get our psychedelics and continued to trip. And uh, so that was like 68 to around 73 and eventually uh, we, we had gotten this crystal acid and we were all in this room and um, we had a school called, we started a school called, called the Desert Sanctuary for Contemporary Learning and we had students there who were like you know kids that were kind of messed up and 
uh, we were sort of trying to help them out. I, they didn't know we were doing psychedelics at first anyway. And of course, a few of us were messing with the girls, which was not so cool. But during this uh, last acid trip, we're all in this room and uh, we it was a very strong acid, like uh, it was like crystal and you snort it instead of like taking it. And it was like, holy cow, like, what do I do now? Uh, and and somebody said, Bill Haynes, what's going on? And he took a handkerchief and he said, I think we took a little too much. And we had never seen him lose it. And I was thinking, I said to everybody, stick with breathing. At least you know you're alive. So during this acid trip, I realized that not only was Bill Haynes, uh, I realized it was all over for me. That Bill Haynes, yeah. not only was he, was he not enlightened, but that he was a little crazy, and I had been there a little too long. Yeah. And then I got into an argument with him one day, and he said, Klein, you ruined all the cars. I must have wrecked one of the cars. And I said, well, when I leave, I'll get my own car. And he said, when are you leaving? I said, in about a month. He said, why don't you leave right now? And then uh, he sent somebody to my house that said, Bill Haynes really doesn't want you to leave. But it was all over. And then I got a hold of Alan Marlowe, I guess. I don't remember how. And he said, come to San Francisco, you know, come to the Zen Center. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't know how I got there, if I had a car or if I flew out there. And I, uh, he said, I'll give you a week um, at the Zen Center as my guest. And uh, then I got I I, uh, um, I met Niels, who lived across the street. Niels and Maggie were together, right? Yeah, yeah, they lived across the street, yeah. So I met them, and so I lived at um, uh, Zen Center for a while, and I started sitting in the basement there, and I was thinking, God, we took all this acid, but we never really processed anything. You know, it was kind of like, yeah, we saw what we saw, but, you know, we never really worked on our mind. And I, I sort of got interested in sitting, you know. Uh, mm. And uh, then I got to know um, Jerry Fuller. And, uh, and uh, oh, after that, I moved into that 150 Laguna house with mm -hmm. uh, Larry Beck. And uh, there was a Jewish guy, Mitch something or other. Durrell. Oh, Mitch Durrell and Judy Gilbert. Yeah. And um, there were about five of us there, five or six of us. It was a big house. And then there was like 191. There were some people that were like students of, um, uh, what's his name, the Monday night class guy. Um, uh, um, yeah, Monday night class. Um, uh, oh, God. Uh, I wrote his name down here. Let's see if uh, I can find uh, 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 Steve Gaskin. Steve Gaskin, right, right. Yeah. So then uh, I think I got a, a job with Niels, uh, working in his... Uh, oh, uh, right, right, right. Oh, let me just say one thing. Yeah, o October 24th, 1968, possession of LSD was made illegal in the United States. Oh, really? Uh-huh. So yeah. in 66, it was still not illegal. So when when we got kid out, kicked out, they just, uh, you know, it was like, Drugs. Well, they, yeah, people look down. I mean, all sorts of people look down on it. It's something terrible. That's why it became illegal. Right. Uh, right. You know? Uh, so, uh, so, oh, you work with Niels. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, this is 73. I realize now. I'd, I'd remember you living in the building. It was 72 because I was work leader there. 73, I was work leader at Green Gulch. And, uh, Dick well, Baker's you got me uh, somewhere in between there. You got me up to Green Gulch. Maybe it was, be, I don't know if it was before Neil's or after Neil's. Yeah, I remember you and I used to hang out. You know, I remember going to you, with you to that place. Oh, God, how do you describe that area? And it's sort of like the avenues, uh, you know, near where uh, the the... What's that green bookstore? What's it oh, called? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, right, right. I used to buy, get books from them. Uh, Clement uh, Street. Yeah, Clement Street. There was some place oh, that was green cool Apple. that had... Oh, Green Apple, that's the name of the bookstore. But there was some place back there that was cool that would have music, like a coffee shop or something. I can remember going there with you. Oh, yeah, the uh, Holy City Zoo. 
Uh, it was it was a comedy club, and we went there. I remember uh, you coming to visit us at Green Gulch, uh, Daya and me, when when Kelly was born. But but I I actually uh, was was stay there for a while. I think I I worked up there for a while uh, with Robert Anderson, and I forget who else. Um, it was some sort of redheaded guy. Uh, another redheaded guy. But anyway, I I don't have too many memories. I remember the big barn where we practiced. Yeah. Uh, I rem- uh, was Reb. Did Reb give talks there? Reb's all over YouTube no, he, nowadays. He, yeah, but he didn't give talks back then. There was another guy, maybe some Jewish guy, who gave a. Really? Did Reb give talks back then? Well, I remember back, him giving 73, talks. Seventy-three. All I remember is Richard Baker giving talks back then. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I spent some time at Green Gulch, and I worked with Niels, and then. Um, what was it, Lenny Brackett, and uh, they were going to build Shobo on. Yeah, Lenny Brackett, Richard Baker's nephew. Uh, so I got invited. No, uh, brother-in-law, invited. brother-in-law, pardon me, go on. Right, I got, uh, Niels got invited, but he couldn't go. And Jerry Fuller got invited. And so uh, we moved up to Gary Snyder's land there, uh, where they were, you know, next door to Gary Snyder. And there was a, an ashram right next door. I forget the guy's name. There was a, Kri- a yoga Kriyananda. 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 Yeah. So th- that was that was really great. You know, sitting up on a hillside in the mornings with Gary practicing, and uh, he had a, like a a sauna where we, we would go like uh, in the evenings, and you know. Yeah. And, and go swimming in the Yuba River, where I got to see Ginny and uh, her girlfriend naked. Uh, <laughs> well, we all swam naked, but you know. Uh, Excellent. What was her name? Renee. Renee, Jenny Baker. Yeah, you were Shabuan was was um, uh, you know uh, Richard and Jenny Baker's place away. That uh, was and what about the carpentry crew? Do you remember them? Well, they were all Japanese. Well, there was Jerry, and yeah. actually, uh, I just got an e- uh, on Facebook. Uh, Tom, there was a guy, Tom Crow and June Crow, who was a carpenter that Trunkpa sent uh, to uh, work on Shobo on because he had heard about it and he wanted Tom to learn, uh, you know, Japanese carpentry. And Tom Crow just died like yesterday. Oh. Well, yeah, I, I just saw that on, on Facebook. Huh, huh. But huh. Uh, they used all of this kind of mud, you know, to do the walls, and they had like sort of bamboo um, uh, lattice work, and they didn't speak English. Uh, and it was, right. kore, kore, you know, bring that over here. It was very cool. Maybe in my son was with that group. They were a very fine temple carpentry uh, company. That somehow Dick Baker got, they took that thing apart in, in Japan and brought it over uh, and reconstructed it there in uh, Nevada City. Well, Ginny, Ginny had, uh, had some inheritance, I think. Uh, oh, you're right. It was right. You're right. Uh, and the people who owned land there, they bought it together, were, were uh, Gary Snyder. Uh, Richard Baker, uh, Allen Ginsberg. Right, right. Uh, at, at some point, Allen sold his to maybe Jerry Brown. Uh, Jerry Brown was part of Ed Brown, uh, who's also, and Jerry Brown is an Ed Brown. So <laughs> Edward Brown, the Zen Center cook. Right, uh, the baker. And, and, and Kriya Nanda, too. And, there was always some tension with Kriyananda because his trip was so much different. Right, uh, but right. But it wasn't terrible. Well, uh, he wasn't. Th- well, he was close, but he wasn't that close. Uh, you know, it was a bit of a walk to get to his place. Yeah, but it was all part of some one uh, real estate uh, deal. Right. Do they still own it? Uh, who? Oh, Dick and Jenny? No, I don't think. No, no, no. 
they haven't for well, years. Well, Zen years. Center doesn't have, own it either. No, huh? no, 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 no. I don't know huh. what happened to it. I could ask huh? Lenny. I, I, I did a podcast with Lenny not long ago. Didn't oh, think cool. to ask him about it. Yeah, it's very cool. Lenny is a very cool guy. Uh, done a lot of great Japanese carpentry. So is Jenny and Dick still uh, uh, both around, or? Yeah, Jenny lives in uh, on Lucas Valley Road. Uh, you know, off there, and uh, Dick's doing great. You know, he's his his. Um, uh, Dharma Sangha, his German group's very strong, and you know right. Creststone uh, Mountain Zen Center. It's 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 still going. Oh really? Uh, huh? Yeah, uh, I've been there a number of times, and I've been actually the only time I left Asia in the last nine years was to go to his. Uh, they flew me to go to his 80th birthday party and the 20th anniversary of uh, Johannes Hof there. Their uh, center, their great group. I love it. I love. I, I, I love uh, Dharma Sangha and those people. I'm reading a history of it now. I'm gonna. You want me to write a, a little introduction? I think maybe an in-house book. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, you know, uh, he's had to bounce back a few times, and and uh, he's done quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and so he's half time in Germany and half time in. Uh, in Crestone, he broke his arm like a year ago or something. I don't. I wouldn't want to be up. You know, it's like up um, almost nine thousand feet, and there's ice and stuff in the winter. Man, it, falling down is too big a deal when you get older to live around <laughs> the ice. Actually, I've, I've tripped a couple of times. Uh, I fell into some cactuses a while ago, but. Uh... <laughs> Hey, in India, I fell into a, a, a slip. It was like a muddy path. I was on, and I, I was walking down this, you know, in Dharamsala. I was walking down it like, you know, every day, several times. And there was this giant nettle bushes right there. And I had to be careful not to touch them, you know, because nettle are like stings. Right, right. And I slipped right into the nettle bush entirely, completely going. I was screaming, and it was like my entire body. And and I, w I was not heavily dressed, you know, because it wasn't cold there then. And I had to crawl out of the mud and everything, and, like, my body was just, like, like red, and, you know, it's like nettles. But it, it was incredible. I mean, after... It all went away in about 45 minutes. And after the initial uh, shock and extreme nettle sort of pain, it, it was like a high. It was great. <laughs> there are some stories about milarepa and nettles, but I forget. Oh, yeah. You can eat nettles. He, he lived on nettles. Nils, yeah. Nils and uh, uh, Maggie used to go pick nettles, mainly Nils, right there in Mere Beach. And they huh. they'd eat they'd eat nettle soup or whatever, yeah. And <laughs> and Nell said the thing with nettles when you pick them you just grab it and then it doesn't with your hand, and then it doesn't uh, you know you don't want to brush it with uh, the back of your hand or anything. You just grab it with your hand and throw it in a bag and he'd say, "God damn man, you just <laughs> grab it like this." Uh, all right, so there you are, and. At Zen Center, you got into sitting. That's really good. And uh, and you were around Alan and Diane, two of the more uh, <laughs> far out people there. I, I built a coffee table for Isan uh, when I worked with Niels. Oh, wonderful. Mahogany coffee table, which I sold for like 25 bucks at that time. Ah, and, and was he living in the building? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, very nice. Very I also nice. remember that Kala Rinpoche came to uh, the Zen Center, and Trunkberg also came to the center. But at that point, I wasn't particularly into Tibetan Buddhism, but, you know, uh, uh -huh. I had just seen them, you know. But I think eventually um, the, Zen, it was, the Zen Center seemed a little too quiet for me at that time. Uh, the, you know, it was always like, 
be quiet or I, I forget what it was. That sort of <laughs> something uh, turned me off to it, you know. Well, it's definitely that's because I wasn't around that much because I was at Green Gulch. <laughs> So at some point, uh, Alan called me up and said, what are you doing? Because he had left the Zen Center and moved to Boulder. Yeah. And I, I said, well, I'm either going to go up to Humboldt County and grow dope, or, um, you know, I'm thinking about meditation. And he said, well, I have a job for you with Marple Landscaping in Boulder, you know, if you want to come. So he also, so there was, again, Alan in my yeah. life. And so he invited me to come to Boulder and... I, got, I, I ran into Beverly Morris on the steps of a Zen Center, and she said, I'm going to Boulder in Ken Campbell's Volkswagen. Wait a minute. You mean Beverly Horowitz? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. What who, did I who say? Who is Morris then, huh? Well, yeah. she's Morris now, yeah. Morris now. She's Morris now, right. Yeah, so Beverly Horowitz and Ken Campbell's, and Ken Campbell was also a Zen student that moved to Boulder. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we drove up to, um, I think, to Gary Snyder's land again. And uh, uh, what was it? Lori and Skinner were there. Oh, she was my girlfriend before uh, uh -huh. him. Yeah, I kind of remember that. And so. But, yeah, that was, uh, we were, you know, we were more like playmates. She had a more serious thing with Skinner. Yeah. And so we hung out there and then we just drove cross country to Boulder. You know, in Ken's Volkswagen. Ah. Huh. So then I be, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I forget where I lived. But I think I lived uh, in on Walnut Street in Boulder and uh, got to uh, in Sangha household, and then I began to get into it. You know. Mm. Uh, at uh, you know, the, the Boulder Center and Trungpa Rinpoche, and eventually I moved up to Rocky Mountain Dharma Center. And lived in that community from uh, ninety to ninety four. How uh, how evolved at ninety? When, when did it start? Oh, it started in like seventy four, seventy three, seventy four. Yeah, but like Ri Richard and Alice, I think started it or were early. The pygmies first, and then Richard and Alice went up there. Oh, uh, the Hasperies, yeah, yeah, huh. Go on, go on. Well, so then I, you know, I just uh, lived in this household in Boulder and began to sit and, you know, I took refuge with Trungpa and Bodhisattva vows. And, uh, you know, I got into the whole thing. And then he created this whole other way of looking at things, this whole Shambhala path, which some people got into and some people, well, most people got into it. It was very Looking back at it, it was very strange. We all had to wear suits, and we had these these balls and uh, dancing and, you know, waltzing, and it was very out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I experienced it. It was very far out. Uh, yeah. D tell, d yeah. Any, tell us more about the Shambhala thing. What, I mean, what was it? Well, you know, there was the sort of the basic Buddhism in the beginning of, you know, uh, shamatha, uh, calm abiding and vipassana, inside meditation, which, you know, was very traditional Buddhist. And uh, What's that the first word you use? What's that shamatha. First word? Well, well, you got to define it, man. Calm, it, it means calm abiding. Basically, it's basically following your breath. And then vipassana has to do with like, you know, uh, basically looking at your mind after you've calmed it down and, you know, looking at it in various ways, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was the, the, the basic practices. And then, you know, there were the, uh, the foundational practices where you had to do 100,000 prostrations uh, to the guru or to a symbol of the guru. And then did you, you had to did do, you do that? I did. I, well, it's called Nundro. Uh, there are four basic practices. Right. I never finished my Nundro. Uh, there was 100,000 prostrations, 100,000 Vajrasattva mantras, which was a purification practice, 100,000 mandalas, which was kind of like giving away your world with rice. It was a ritual with rice, and you sort of create a mandala with the rice. And I, I got halfway through that, and the last one, you had to do a million 
Guru Yoga, which was a, a particular mantra, a particular chant. And I, I didn't get to that point. And once you finished your Nundro, you got this initiation called Abhisheka, where you were initiated into higher practices. But at, wow. at some point in the 70s, I think, Trungpa Rinpoche began to um, introduce uh, creating an enlightened society. Uh, yeah. And that was, the, that was the Shambhala teachings. And Pema Chodron also taught both Buddhism and Shambhala. Mm. And then there was a series of um, um, weekends, uh, Shambhala level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. And then there were more advanced levels that you had to go through. And um, I, I can't spell it all out now. It's not sort of clear You're in my mind. You're doing pretty good, Howie. It, it, it tell me more than I knew. <laughs> and so uh, this whole idea of enlightened society, uh, and it, it, and they were, you know, uh, they had some kind of uh, principles of um, enlightened. There was an enlightened king called the Rigdon, and uh -huh. um, I, I should know more about this, but you know, I, I'm not spelling it out right now. I mean, you know. Uh, all of his books, you know, Creating Enlightened Society. And uh, um, I mean, there is all his books, which are all the Buddhist books. And uh, and then there's all the Shambhala books and all the trainings. And eventually, when he died in 1987, his son took over, uh, who's known as Sakyang Mipam. And there's been a kind of a, I don't know if you heard about a split in the community where he was sort of busted for sexual improprieties and now so as a lot of people went with him and there's still a lot of people that are still practicing you know i've i i don't really study the shambhala teachings very much anymore except every so often i'll look at look at some of the books but i pretty much uh you know look into the buddhist stuff stuff but i'm not really studying with anybody now particularly i uh but, you know, when I lived in uh, Sonoma County, which I did for, what, 15 years. Well, with John Tarrant, uh, which I spent a well, lot of time with you up yeah, there. Yeah, but I was, I was John, with John eight or nine years, and I was in Sebastopol in that house for six years. Uh, I would see you, you know, quite a bit now and then. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times, I mean, I would you'd you'd tell me about some... Shambhala thing that was happening, and I'd go meet you over at the Shambhala place for a meditation or something in Santa, Santa, Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa, yeah. And, and you'd right. go to uh, uh, Bill Kwong's uh, Gangoji for uh, some sort of Shambhala ceremony. Oh, I, I, I still lead that practice. There's a thing called the Sadhana of Mahamudra. I've been leading it on Zoom. And it was something that Trungpa Rinpoche wrote about spiritual materialism uh, and uh, cutting through. Well, well, um, let's see. Well, how people, you know, uh, think they're going to get something out of their practices, and you know. Uh, so there's this whole sadhana that I um, that I uh, lead, and this is another interesting thing about memory. I've, I've forgotten a lot of things and a lot of uh, how to get to a lot of places in Santa Rosa, but I I've completely memorized all of the liturgies. Well, of course, I've been doing them for forty, fifty years now, you know. <laughs> and the uh, the Sadhana of Mahamudra, earth, water, fire, and all the elements, the animate and the inanimate, the trees and the greenery and so on, all partake of the nature of self-existing equanimity which is quite simply what the great wrathful one is. Well, it's it's about it's actually about Padmasambhava, which mm. is the Nyingma mm. lineage, and about the Karmapas, which is the Kagyu lineage, and it brings these two lineages together. Uh, so that's what this sadhana is about, and I, and I still lead it. I have mm. it memorized, you know. Mm. So. Mm. You can and, recite. Hey, if you, you want to recite more, I'd, I'd be happy to hear it. Well, I'll, do, I'll give you the first part. Earth, right. water, fire, and all the elements, the animate and the inanimate, the trees and the greenery and so on, 
all partake of the nature of self-existing equanimity, which is quite simply what the great wrathful one is. In the spontaneous wisdom of the trikaya, I take refuge with body, speech, and mind in order to free those who suffer at the hands of the three lords of materialism and are afraid of external phenomena, which are their own projections. I take this vow in meditation. And then there's a little uh, phrase that uh, goes, meditate, uh, uh, let's see, what is it, meditate in I'm spacing it out. Well, the other part goes, in the boundless space of suchness, in the play of the great light, all the miracles of sight, sound, and mind are the five wisdoms and the five Buddhas. This is the mandala which is never arranged, but is always complete. It is the great bliss, primeval, and all-pervading, whom... It is boundless equanimity, which has never changed. It is unified into a single circle beyond confusion. In its basic character, there is no longer any trace of ignorance nor of understanding. Nothing whatever, but everything arises from it, yet it reveals the spontaneous play of the mandala. And it goes on from there. It's about an hour long. What? You mean you you know the whole hour? I know pretty much, pretty much. Uh, you know, I when I don't I don't do it spontaneously. I have when I do it, I I'm reading it from a a text. Yeah. But you know, sometimes when I'm writing and or wake up at three in the morning and I'll just do it or just it'll sort of pop into my head. Ah, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, I have to read the Heart Sutra. You know, when I chant it. <laughs> I mean, no, no, not if I'm chanting with a bunch of people. But, well, you know, I still remember. I don't. I don't remember the translation, but I remember kanji, zaibo, zatogo, jin, han, yahara, mita, shoken, go, on, kai. So I don't remember the whole thing, but right, I remember right. it. I I could do it in English. Oh, uh, I'm I'm so partial to that. Uh, what you you were doing then, which is a, uh, uh, I'd call it a, an onyomi. Uh, that that's the type of Japanese, you know. It's it's an old style. Oh, they Yomi don't do means it that reading. Way anymore? It's the own reading, but that uh-huh. what? What do would they you still say? do it? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Uh, they don't do it in Japanese. It's Zen Center in English. Uh, I mean, last what was the last time I did? That? Maybe maybe ten years ago. <laughs> Or nine years ago, I was, you know, in in one of the centers, and at some point when there was the Heart Sutra being done, but yeah, or at Tassara. Uh, well, yeah, you're, you're, I think your English version is probably different from the one we do. Uh, in, well, of course, we were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there there have been different English versions. Uh, Allen Ginsberg uh, took. Uh, Suzuki Roshi's uh, and, uh, version, what Suzuki, Su, Suzuki didn't think of it as a translation. He had the, you know, when he made the, the sutra cards to chant uh, very early yeah. on, like 61, uh, you know, he had it printed. I think he had it printed at a Chinese printer uh, and with the kanji, beautiful cards. There, there were two types. There was a one page two sided, and there was a two page four sided. They're they're on you know, cute dot com. You want to see them? Uh-huh. Anyway, there's the kanji, then there's the r- ramaji. In other words, how you how you chant it. You can read it in ramaji. You know, as letters that we understand. And then he put uh, running along with it the basic meaning of all the uh, of of um, all the characters and what was being said. And, you know, he didn't think of it as a translation, but you can see it online, you know. People, I mean, I have it there, and, and you can see it, people saying, you know, it's yeah. Suzuki Roshi's translation of the hard And Allen Ginsberg chanted it. He thought it was great the way it was. He came and asked Suzuki for permission. He used to come to Zen Center and sit uh, before I was there, you know, in the early 60s sometimes. But it wasn't uh-huh. his trip, you know. He liked to play his harmonium and chant and stuff. Right, right, right. Uh, but but he'd chant that. I had I recorded him. I talked to him on the phone. Oh, maybe the last year he was alive in in New York, and 
I've got a tape with him chanting, and I don't know where it is. I mean, it's with my tapes. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, I have hundreds of them. Uh, yeah, what I'd do you look- do with all these cassette tapes nowadays, you know? Oh, well, it's all, I, I digitized everything that's important. Uh, yeah. And, you know, when I interviewed, uh, uh, all the all the Suzuki stuff was digitized, digitized long ago, and it's been re-digitized. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I paid for the re Well, I think Cuke Archives paid for the digitizing and the re-digitizing of it. Uh and uh, but um, uh, um, the, uh, the 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 tapes I have left there uh, are just ones uh, from interviews, and I would tell people when I interviewed them that uh, I wouldn't keep the tapes, you know, and so that it made people feel more comfortable, and so there'd just be a transcript. So I've never, I never did anything with them, and I erased a lot of them and would record over them. Uh, uh-huh. Now I wish I hadn't have done that, saved them all, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. There's, I, you know, the I like Philip Whalen's. Uh, I quote Philip Whalen off uh, often uh, when he said, um, "I was talking about all the loss at the, all the great Buddhist art and writings that have been lost," and he went, "Oh, David." Just enough survives, so uh, that's that's the way I look at it. Uh, so, anyway, uh, that's impressive. You're still doing that. Uh, wow. So, uh, you know, you were making it sound like, well, I don't really practice that anymore. Then, yeah, but you actually do. You were just talking about which parts you practice and which parts you don't practice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I you know. Uh, it's, it seems more and more necessary in these crazy times. Uh, I, I mean, you know, it's it's our it's our history, it's our lineage, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the, our center, uh, the the Santa Rosa Center, kind of lost its place, and we're just meeting like you know one Thursday a month, and then we do the uh, the sadhana uh, on uh, the uh, new moon, which is coming up in a couple of days. And, uh, but the, the, then there's like central headquarters now where that, uh, uh Joanne Fordham and, uh, and, um, there's a thing called Walter, Ocean. Joanne and Walter. Yeah. Well, Joanne and Walter. And, uh, they, they kind of have a website where there's a, you know, you could practice, there's a lot of zoom stuff going on now. And actually I did something with Anam Tupton last week. Oh, uh, I love a, him. What did you do? He's great. Oh, man, I'll tell you, just looking at him was enough. I mean, he's so beautiful. And uh, yeah, he was giving a talk on ordinary mind. And um, uh, also the thing called, well, tamagi shepa, which is a Tibetan word for ordinary mind or or sort of resting in awareness. And I I mean, it was so nice. You know, usually I'm thinking, oh, I got to go somewhere, do something else. But to hang out with him. Uh, it was beautiful, you know. Hey, tell who he is. Anam Tupton uh, is a Tibetan. I think he's a Nyingma lineage teacher. And uh, where is he out in? Uh, I Point where Richmond. He's... Point Richmond. Point Richmond. We used to go out there. Actually, you you went and I went and yeah, I used my to... friend Barbara and uh, he used to give talks every Sunday. It was my yeah favorite place to go in the Bay Area. He's got a nice book called No Self, No Problem. And uh, he's a young man. He's probably in his 40s or maybe in his 50s. And uh, really uh, and speaks pretty good English with a little bit of an accent. And um, he's got a, um, a Zoom uh, thing available. I, figure, I don't know what his center is called, you know. Uh, but Anam Tuptim, T-H-U-B-T-O-N. On a A N A M, yeah. So he's cool. Oh yeah, he should. Now they that group. Uh, I love Point Richmond. It's a, a, a wonderful place. They call their group the Dharmata Foundation. I'm just looking at it now. Dharmata, uh, yeah. D- Dharm- Dharmata. That's the way uh, we pronounce it. Dharmata is probably okay too. 
No, no, I don't know how to pronounce these things. Uh, and um, they, they bought a, a beautiful redwood church. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful place to go on, on Sundays. Uh, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought it was the, the... Well, anyway, I've said enough about it. Uh, yeah, he's he's written a few other books since No Self, No Problem. I forget what the latest one is. The Magic but, Awareness. Uh, right, right. But that just said, uh, it says there's more, but it doesn't list them. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's so much Dharma out there on on YouTube and, uh, you know. Uh, it's, you know, his um, a, a teaching approach, though, is he dropped a lot of the forms, uh, and and so he has a uh, very straightforward, simple, uh, almost like sectarian compared to some Tibetan stuff. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, he's he's basically hip. Yeah, it, it's, he's. I think he's. Uh, I yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, also the people who went and, you know, going there early and and uh, afterwards and having tea and coffee and goodies and talking to people. It was a great scene. Uh, well, and you know, I love Point he, Richmond. He, he, on the Zoom thing, before the hour before he gives his talk, he does like a guided meditation. Uh, right. Well, maybe 45 minutes, yeah. Right. Oh, that, I forgot about that. That's true. I'd go there, and there'd be beforehand there'd be the guided meditation. But people didn't have to go; they could be hanging out downstairs. Uh, that mm, I don't know. He didn't say much. It was mainly just sitting, is what I remember. Yeah, and every so often nice. he would he would just sort of guide something about you right. Know, what, your I remember one of his talks. He said it was like on Mind the Gap. You know, like if if you go to London. Uh, there's, oh, yeah, yeah, you right, know, the gap right. before going on the uh, subway or whatever it's called. Right, so you don't uh, walk over into the track, yeah. So your foot doesn't go down into that hole, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, mind, your, mind the gap. Anyway, this whole thing, uh, that talk was talking about meditating in the uh, micro gaps in the day. Right, and right, I, right. I'm really into that. Uh, I, uh, anyway, it was great. He 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 gave great talks. I loved it. Um, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So uh, ah, uh, you know, one thing I remember talking to you is you knew a lot about the Hindu scene in America. You knew where the different teachers were, and you you explained to me once that they had uh, divided America up. So they didn't compete with each other. <laughs> I don't remember that, but uh, yeah. yeah. And so in um, Santa Fe, in Española, between Santa Fe and Taos, there's one group. I can't remember what it is. A pretty well-known uh, teacher in right. you know, ashram there, Yogi Bhajan, and uh, he was a Sikh. And there was, where was Satchitananda? Was he New York? I think so. Yeah, I think he had a place upstate. Uh, and there was a guy in the 50s that everyone followed, Ramana Maharshi, who, who, whose big thing was, ask the question, who am I? Yeah, you but know. he never came to America. No, he never came to America, yeah. but a lot of people followed him. Oh, and I, I, I love I did meet this guy. No, he, Ramana Dodge, Maharshi, was, he like died in like 55 or something. He was... Big or maybe sixty. He was big in the first half of the twentieth century. I've I went and spent four months at the Ramana Ashram. Uh, oh, Re just, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's the mountain. Uh, Tiruvannamalai is the town. I right, absolutely right. love Ramana Maharshi. I think. Oh, he's cool, the cool. Ultimate, yeah. I was also a Krishnamurtiite for a long time. I read a lot of his books. Uh huh. Uh -huh, he's and from I that area him too. In New York. Huh? I saw him in New York. At, you know. No, I don't know. Tell me. 
Well, you know, he, he used to give uh, lectures down and, uh, is it possible, is it really possible to, you know, he would, you know, look at your mind. I have I have a friend now who's still into him, you know, <laughs> follows his teachings, you know. Uh-huh. Well, he he was, you know, he was uh, the, 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 Ramana Maharshi from Chennai. Uh, I mean, he's from uh, Tamil Nadu. And Chennai is the big city there, and, and Tiruvannamalai is, you know, four-hour drive from there. Krishnamurti came from that same area. Uh, oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. He was discovered, you know, by the uh, uh, Theosophy people, and the big Theosophy Center is there in Chennai. And uh, I stayed in the Krishnamurti Center in Chennai, uh, and— I'd go, oh, God, man, you're going and walking around in the, the theosophy. Is that right? Theosophy, yeah, the theosophy place. Yeah, it's right. giant. It's giant. And it's like getting away from India. You know, all of a sudden there's no traffic. And you, your way, it's like, you know, there's, there's streets and there's some old homes that, you know, they used to be a bustling place. Uh, and it's more like a has-been now. Uh, the 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 uh, Krishnamurti Center was not like that. It was very together. It was the nicest place I stayed. It was very cheap. You have to get be accepted to stay there, and if you stay there, you're expected to spend the first part of the day in the library and meeting with other people there, talking with them, having breakfast with them. Very interesting people, wow. like some yeah. teachers and people in the. Oh, it was nice, and they they uh, I brought them some books, you know, that I'd written, and they uh, had a committee decide yes, we will accept these books. <laughs> anyway, it was neat, and I listened to Krishnamurti tapes, and then I could go out and be free, and it was very cheap to stay there. It was wonderful food. Uh, anyway, uh, that's from there, and you know who who else is big was from Chennai is. Um, uh, 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 the other guru, he was a contemporary of Ramana Maharshi. Oh, really? Uh, oh. yeah, and he's just as famous. Uh, there was a Hatha yogi called Vishnu Devananda, who I also kind of used to, um, but he, he was more of the physical yoga, you know, the, the uh, asanas. Yeah. Um, I'll think, I'll think of this guy. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, Pondicherry. Pond, all I have to do is write Guru oh, okay. Pondicherry. I, okay, okay. Now, you, 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 um, what was his name, too? I, I, you just got me. When when you said Pondicherry, well, uh, him and the mother, right? He, he had the yeah, mother, Yeah, yeah, the mother and him. Uh, uh, Aurobindo. Aurobindo. Aurobindo, right. Aurobindo's trip was the evolution of consciousness and very positive about uh, so, sort of like Shambhala, you know, uh, creating... Yeah, he a, was more more psychological than, than uh, devotional. Uh, well, maybe both, but... Yeah, well, uh, he believed you could affect the... the existence, the phenomena, the universe, and uh, the evolution of consciousness. And, uh, 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 you know, they started that, what's the name of that place they started? I guess it's called Ar Auroville. Uh, right. God, right, I was right, right was near like it. Yeah. I, I was right near it. I knew people that had connections there. It's supposed to be a wonderful place, but I didn't go because... It seemed like a place to go for a month, if you want to really uh -huh. get to know it. And it's not pleasant to travel, uh, right? You know, from one place to another. There. Um, I don't know. If, I think I don't think I have any books by Aurobindo, actually. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But I remember him. You know, I have Ramana Maharshi. Actually, when I was at the ashram, they had a race around the lake, and. Uh, I won the race. I was thinking I was on the track team, and I never won any races. But at the ashram, I won this race, and they gave me a book called Day by Day with Bhagavan, 
which oh, was a, by which whom? talks with Ramana Maharshi, you know. You know, Godman is the um, great uh, translator of uh, Ramana Maharshi, and uh, uh, he was he he was he was hanging out at the uh, Ramana Ashram. You know, I got to meet him. And what was his name? Uh, I think his name's David Godman. Anyway, uh-huh. it's Godman. Ring a bell? Uh, and uh, Ramana Maharshi's trip. Uh, what he was. He was, uh, uh, it was complimentary to Aurobindo. Ramana Maharshi's trip was, you can't really um, change the, pardon me, you can't change the universe. He said the, really the only, the only important act you can do is to wake up. Right, uh, right. You know, or sur- he, he, uh, ask a, the question, "Who am I?" or surrender, or both. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did say there. There are two roots. There's insight, and there's devotion. But I, I think of him as more of an insight guy. Totally. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he well, he would just wanted you to just keep looking at your mind to see. Right. Well, it's sort of like to see the empty quality, or right. Like, you know. And now, somebody I, I was praising him once on com long ago, and somebody wrote and said, yeah, but he didn't believe in meditation. I said, well, uh, he did say uh, that two hours a day was enough. <laughs> well, you basically, know. it's all day long of looking at your mind in some way. Right, you know. right. Of course, you want to have seamless practice, but in terms of seated meditation, I mean, you can't right. say... Ramana Maharaja was against meditation. He spent his whole life meditating. But in terms of formal meditation, he he did. They had a. I went and sat there in the mornings, and I loved it. There was no schedule. It was just open. You could come and wow. sit, and you could lie down. You could do anything you want. People would come in with incense, <laughs> uh, and you could leave when you wanted. You know. And they had so wonderful. So there must have been some people were around that were still that had known him while he was alive, right? Yeah, Godman did, uh-huh. uh, and uh, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and the services there were great. I loved them. Wow. They were they were unique. Uh, 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 and in the e- the morning service and the evening service were different. The evening service was an hour. It was like meditation. I go sit, and there'd be a group of men, like fifty men on the left and fifty men on the w- women on the right, and they would chant this stuff. I guess Step Ramana Maharshi had written. It was very, it was very flowing, and they'd sort of respond to each other. It was wonderful. And in the morning there'd be, there'd be a, a sort of. Uh, more walking, circumventing the altar, which was very large. Uh-huh. Uh, anyway, it it um, you know uh, it, it had a wonderful feeling. I loved being around there. Uh, very good. You must have been in your twenties or something. No, no, that was eleven years ago. Oh, so, oh, more recently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had I had no interest in shopping around when I was young. Younger, I liked the Zen Center. I just, you know, yeah. Uh, but I just worked. I just worked on my archives there and had a little apartment. And Katrinka joined me for a month. And oh, Clay oh, went. So you both were there. Wow. wow. She was there for a month. I was there for four months. And Clay was there the whole four months, but not with me. He was screwing around. Clay, Clay was over here with his family, with the new baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I haven't seen him for a while. But he's a good father. He loves his little daughter, and uh, those pictures he put up on Facebook were kind of nice. Me, both his daughters. Uh, oh, that other one's a, she's a terror. That the first one. What's her name? Uh, Aunt Lucia. Yeah, I was talking to her this morning, and her mother, Rita. Rita's wonderful. Um, yeah, Lucia came over here, so we're sitting outside, and she she kind of uh, sort of uh, came into the house and grabbed my mala. And we was playing with the beads. I said, where'd you get that from, you know? Yeah, she, yeah. She's a terror. She's kind of feisty. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's calming down a little. 
now. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, she's she's whew, she's definitely got some energy. But she she just turned four. She's been here. Yeah. Rita and uh, oh really? Lucia were here for a month. Uh, oh, very cool. Yeah, two three years ago. Well, uh, two two and a half years ago. Uh, and Clay, Clay and April and Isla are going to try to make it here. Their ideas in the fall, but if they don't get if they don't get vaccinated, they're not going to be able to come unless there's some uh -huh. change. That there could be yeah, a change. Yeah, my, my landlady's kind of an anti-vaxxer. God, there's so many anti-vaxxers in America. God, this can't. Be, yeah, she just, just sent me an email with uh, Ivermectin uh, Society that she's part of or something. You know, uh, a lot of the um, I, I know I know I was just talking to Katrinka back because Rita hasn't been vaccinated, and I said, "Well, if you want to come back, uh, it, it, it might be might be you won't have to be. That things are loosening up, right?" Uh, but but I said to Katrinka, I said, "Who do we know that that hadn't been vaccinated here?" One guy I can think of, he's American, right? Yeah. And he believes every conspiracy theory, and he believes all the, you know, a lot of the anti-vax stuff comes from the Russian news agency, uh, uh -huh. and it like um, Infowars, uh, Alex yeah. Jones thing. Uh, their main source is uh, Russian bots and R Russian news agencies. They just print anything they want, right? Well, and the Russian news agency uh, RT, I think it's called, it's uh, it's pushed all this anti-vax stuff. Uh, in in all its uh, it, its various foreign uh, subsidiaries, you know, English, Spanish, this and that. Really? But guess I what? What the logic is? Guess what? In Russian, for Russia, they're aggressively pro-vaccine. They're just trying to disrupt the world, and they're very successful. Well, look what they're doing in China. I mean, you can't you can't uh, even move without getting a vaccine, or you know. Yeah, they, they're that's not smart. That's <sighs> that's not smart. I mean, when they closed the beaches here for a few months, a couple of years ago, that's dumb. I mean, yeah, you, they closed the parks and beaches. That's stupid. Then you force people to meet indoors. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, even at the farmer's markets in the early days, people were wearing masks. Uh, uh, but, oh, uh, God. You had to wear a mask. Until a few months ago, you had to wear a mask here riding a motorbike. Everybody <laughs> everybody did. Everybody yeah. did. There was, a, there was a guy who led an anti-mask -ma -ma uh, demonstration, uh, you know, early on. He got two years in prison. Right away, really? Wow. Yeah, they, they let him out wow. though. He recanted, so and he he's the he, he's the head of the big punk band here. They let him out after he recanted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hmm. So um, let's see. Uh, so you, let me let me go back to something. You come from the Bronx. Yeah. Uh, as we've well established, Pelham Parkway area, huh? No, actually, I used to play handball in Pelham Parkway, which is where Diane lived. Right. Dia lived. But I lived across from the Bronx Zoo. I could oh. see the buffalo from my window. Oh, know? that is so cool. Well, yeah. uh, I, I walked to the Bronx Zoo from Dia, 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 Diane's place. Uh, not that far away. Uh, yeah, yeah, so... Yeah. yeah, I was born in 1942 and uh, lived uh, across from the Bronx Zoo. Nice. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went to a trade school for high school. I went to Gompers uh, to study electric. Uh, I was going to be an electrician, but I never really paid attention. So I went to college <laughs> for a couple of years. I went to college for a couple of years, CCNY, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, when I was in my early uh, 20s. And then, of course, the 60s happened, and I kind of went off into the blue yonder. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that was an education. Um, yeah. Yeah. I grew up uh, in uh, near, very near, walking distance from the zoo in Fort Worth, 
And uh, frequently in the morning, I would awaken to the sounds of lions roaring and elephants trumpeting. Yeah, yeah, I could hear and on, on peacocks too. Oh, uh, huh? Oh, no, like God! Yeah, peacocks. Yeah, mm. green. Do you were at Green Gulch when there were peacocks? I, I I don't remember, but I guess yeah. I they didn't last long. They were there uh, seventy two and seventy three. Alan Chadwick brought them in. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, Green Gulch was famous for its gardens. Uh, it was, you know. Well, it still is. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I miss it. I'd love to go to Green Gulch and Tassahara. Uh, Tassahara is. Have, have you ever spent any time in Tassahara? You know, I did. I don't know if you remember, I had a girlfriend, Diana, uh, at that point, and I just was going to Diana my who? Picture. Diana who? Diana Kedrovich. Um, uh, we lived uh, together on um, Clement Street, uh, um, 4th Avenue, 212 4th Avenue. Oh, that's and, why uh, I remember I, Clement. Go on. I have a picture of her at, at Tassahara, with some guy who's I don't recognize, you probably wouldn't know him. And I was thinking, and with my memory being what it is, I was thinking, oh shit, I did go to Tassahara. Because it was a picture of Diane there, you know. So I, I don't know how long I was there or what I did there, but I, I was there for, you know, something. Do you have any high points or particular memories of people or anything throughout this illustrious career of yours? Hmm. That you would like to share? Well, let me think. Uh, Allen Ginsberg, weren't you staying in the same uh, place as him in uh, Boulder? Actually, I took a flight once, and I wound up sitting next to Allen Ginsberg. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. Oh, well, this I'll tell you a high point. Uh When, I was, when we were in the Bronx, we, we sort of got into poetry, and it was a place called La Metro, which was down on 2nd Avenue on the Lower East Side, and uh, was like in a basement. And all these famous poets there, the, the Fugs were also there, the people that had that uh, band. Oh, I love uh, the th Fugs. Yeah. I still uh, Ken love Ken Weaver them. And, uh, and Allen Ginsberg, and even Bob Dylan and, uh, showed up there once uh, w with uh, Joan Baez. And that was sort of an education of going to poetry readings in uh, in the in New York City, you know, on the Lower East Side, and also uh, my influence of jazz. I used to go to Thelonious Monk, Ooh. Uh, uh, on uh, you know uh, down on uh, the Five Spot, uh, and I saw Coltrane at Tom uh, at Town Hall. Wow. And, uh, you know, I had a big jazz connection, uh, you know, in those early days. And I got to see, you know, Miles Davis and all of these, you know, greats. Wow. Uh, so that was sort of a high, a high point. Yeah. Uh, with the jazz and the poetry readings. Wow. Uh, you know, when you began to sort of wake up to other things and living in the Bronx and, you know, going yeah. to high school. You, you, span uh, the, you span the beatnik to the hippie era. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Wow. And so, so going down to the village and you know and and hearing people. Uh, mm. Yeah. Wow, that is cool. The beatnik thing was uh, a, a, a small group with a big influence. It would be hard to see, you know. It's and Peter Olofsky too. You know, Ginsburg's partner. Seeing right. him down. At uh, oh, readings. really? Hmm. And then he did, you know, and then he visited our community, so we got to sort of hang out with him up there, you know, at uh, hmm. Millbrook, the ashram. Ah. So, hey, uh, I heard a lot about Millbrook. Uh, you know, I did uh, two, uh, I, 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 I did, so, so the inter I did uh, podcasts with uh, Jeannie DePrima. There was a couple of them. They were so long. Uh, that that I made it into maybe I just did one and made it into two. I, I might have talked to her twice, uh, but, but we talk every now and then. We've been communicating a lot. Uh, 
she was very clear about all that stuff in the past. And yeah, everything. well, she was a teenager. She was a, maybe younger than a teenager, and there was also uh, what, she uh, Dominique, uh, yeah, who calls it, and she was Minnie in those days. Right. Uh, well, Leroy Jones' uh, daughter. Right. Right. Well, when when Jeannie was at Millbrook. Uh, she, I mean, she, she. When they moved there, she was eight years old, uh, and she's, she's the oldest like, kid. Yeah. They said this this well, weekend we're going to have a children's trip, and they 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 dosed the children. Well, oh, they know, did it. The, they made her take acid every week. Oh, yeah. really? She oh, told yeah, you that? Was, yeah, she did not like it. No, you should hear what she has to say about all that. And when Alan. Marlo, I mean, she loved Alan. She was with Alan when he died. She stayed with him. But he uh, he uh, asked her to forgive him for what they'd done with her there. Oh, no and kidding. That, he, that They were crazy to do that. Yeah. Uh, but her mother, Diane, wouldn't apologize. She said, we did the best we could uh, considering what we knew at the time and this and Well, that. they were hardcore. Yeah, yeah, they were. But Jeannie... Uh, having been through unbelievable stuff, uh, uh, a lot of which she gets into, and having gone through some pretty uh, low times in her life, has come out of it just so, um, just so impressed with her. And like with her, you know, her having like very difficult, traumatic experiences forced on her by her parents, completely forgave them, like, she just she talked to her mother about it once, and she said, she, "Whatever her mother said was all right." She just wanted to at least have one conversation. She's really impressive. Uh, Very cool. And there was also Alex. Yeah. Now, now Minnie Dominique has uh, some sort of talk show or something in L.A. Uh, oh really? Huh? Yeah. Uh, Alex is a is a pianist. Uh, I don't I don't know how successful or whatever. He's down in L.A. too. Tara. Oh, really? Wow. Tara. I don't know where Tara is. Oh, I forgot about Tara. Yeah. Jeannie knows where they are. She keeps up with all of them. Well, Tara's not Alan's daughter, is she? No, oh, she's yeah, she Grant. Is. She's I think Grant's oh. daughter. Oh, okay. And Grant All stayed right. with yeah. Diane. Diane died like a year ago or something. Grant is, was still with... No, maybe it's not Grant. Maybe it was after Grant. I No, mm. no. It's the guy after Grant. Anyway, I can't... I, I, yeah, I don't remember I'm, that. I'm losing the details. You, you talked about the League for Spiritual Discovery that Alan was into. Uh I, I think uh, that turned into the what was it called the the the, the, the oh there was another name for it after that with the, the um, you know Timothy Leary and and all all these uh, people uh, trying to enlighten the world with enormous amounts of cheap LSD uh, the uh, Brotherhood of Love. Oh, of Eternal Light, yeah. Brotherhood yeah. of Eternal Light. Yeah, those people hung out at Diane's. Uh, yeah, they were they were another group of uh, uh, acid producers, yeah. Uh, um, and uh, uh, um, Walt and Ed, they were very, very big. And, and uh, Diane's house had any... It, it, any amount of acid, grass, and cocaine was available there, and and mainly for free. And DMT was was definitely a very interesting as well. Oh, DMT, uh, yeah, wow. I remember some when I was living at Millbrook, somebody came to my room and said, uh, uh, "There's this new drug. Uh, let me tell you about it first. You smoke it, and then you completely lose it. And, you know, he sort of, like, wanted to prepare me. But you couldn't really prepare somebody, you know. And it was definitely, I felt I was in a giant popcorn box. And it was, like, silver, and these big molecules were, like, 
hitting the walls, going back and forth. Uh, yeah, it was kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, DMT is very powerful. It's like a 30-minute acid trip. Right, or even less, maybe 15 minutes, you know. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I had it a few times. <laughs> um, mm, anyway, uh, hmm. well, uh, anything else? Well, let me think. Uh, well, the, 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 the high point question got me for a second, but then I thought of, yeah, you know, hanging out with the poets and, and, and well, just just being around, you know, uh, these, you know, teachers that uh, Trunk Rinpoche invited to Boulder, the Karmapa and the Black Crown Ceremony and Kalu Rinpoche, and just being around some of these kind of amazing teachers, uh you know, just, uh, just you know, Trungpa Rinpoche, just, and just being around Trungpa Rinpoche, too, uh, at some of those, uh, you know. I mean, he was kind of a wiggy guy, kind of bizarre at times, <laughs> but very brilliant. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, that was, you know, a continuous high point, just being in Boulder and, yeah. and just being through all of those uh, crazy uh, times, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was visiting Boulder. I I visited Boulder for weeks at a time, uh, and it was um, it was uh, always interesting. There was always stuff happening, um, and uh, it was. I mean, Zen Center is just dead compared to what was happening with Trungpa's group. Uh, even even when Trungpa was in San Francisco, going to hear one of his talks. There can be amazing things happen. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And another another thing is, you know, hanging out with Jacob Fishman. Yeah. And Renee and Renee Pate. Yeah. Uh, were kind of uh, high points too, like these two wiggy guys, you know. Yeah. Uh, 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 Jacob. Is Jacob still around? Did he die or what? God, I'd like to talk to him if he's still alive. He was living up on Buchanan, right up the street I, from... I know. Uh, I, 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 I wonder, because I have been in touch with him some. Uh, uh, let me let me check. Let me check. He uh, took me out on his boat sailing, which was great. Uh, Jacob took me playing pool once. He Well, I went and found Jacob. I don't know. I went and visited him. He was running... A, uh, pre uh, the projector in a porn theater in the Tenderloin, <laughs> all right. And Jacob, uh, Jacob grew up with a, in a Sicilian family in New York. He said, "Yeah, my uncle delivered. My uncle, my uncle was the milkman. He delivered bodies for the mafia." Wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so day, Jacob had had uh, seen a lot as a kid, but he was a pretty gentle guy uh, himself. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I had to protect him from getting kicked out of Tassahara. I, you know, good Lord. I mean, I'd say, hey, Jacob, you got to cool it, man. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he had some uh, exploits there, that extracurricular, uh, but um, managed, to, uh, managed to, I guess I was director, uh, get him not kicked out. <laughs> uh and uh, but anyway, so uh, I stayed. I hung out, and and until uh, at some point we met, and he took me to this pool hall on Market Street. It was like an old old fashioned billiard hall. They had billiard tables, uh -huh. snooker, pool, and uh, so he said, "Do you, you want to play straight pool? You know the the old fashioned thing where where you yeah. you rack the balls and you break them and." Just call your shots and shoot anything. He ran the table. He wow. was incredible wow. pool player. Very uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. He could have made a living on that. Uh, uh. Wow. Uh, yeah, interesting guy. All right, let me let me see. Now I. Oh, you know what happened to him? He was a long time ago, twenty five years ago or something. He was walking down the street in San Francisco, 
and he passed out. And then he wakes really? up. He wakes up in the hospital. It's like four days later or something, with a new liver. Oh yeah, that sounds familiar. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I can't. All right. Now you're you're really. I, I'm I'm gonna. I'm gonna try to get a hold of Jacob. Uh, Oh, good. Yeah, let me know uh, if he's still around. He has. I think he's got a daughter somewhere. Well, yeah, I I knew the mother. Uh, they were living uh, on Laguna. Uh, they didn't last long, but they had a daughter. Um, uh, have we run out of uh, material? <laughs> well, it's it's been an hour and a half, so yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Last thing I see from him right now is 12 years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, but I think did you you remember the the young museum had a had a thing on uh anniversary of uh, Hate ashbury or something and uh, some, Renee went and I went I think you might have you and I might have gone together do you remember that uh huh and uh, that I don't remember well maybe you weren't there Jacob was there yeah, I might have been there it doesn't mean you might, I, yeah you, know. you just don't remember uh, 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 Donnie uh, Don D'Angelo Donnie Crockin uh, oh, oh yeah 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 and, uh, you know, Wavy Gravy was there. I, I just remember the people. I can't remember what happened or what we saw. I probably had pictures on the wall. I mean, what can you do? Donnie Kraken, didn't he own a, he sort of cooked in a restaurant or something? He started He started the first restaurant out of Zen Center, uh, the Good Karma. Ah, oh, Good Karma Cafe. What was it on uh, um, near the park there? Yeah, I mean, I I can see it in my mind. He was sort of macrobiotic. He also did uh, maybe the first baking at, at the city center uh, uh -huh. and wanted to run a bakery out of there. And he got started on it, but, it, um, you know, he probably ran, he ran into bureaucratic problems. I'm uh, impressed that I can remember some of these things. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, he... He's and you know he's still. I mean, the last time I went, he would always be at Green Gulch on Sunday. Huh. yeah, and he'd go swimming uh, in the you know in. He, it doesn't matter how cold it was. He, you know, he's in incredible shape. He goes to the gym all the time. I remember uh, he had a girl. Did he have a girlfriend? He's not gay. No, he's not gay. Yeah, we know he's been living with the same woman for many, many years. Um, What's her name? She, well, I can't remember. Katrinka and she are friends. Uh, uh huh. Uh, you know, maybe out of Katrinka has all these Grateful Dead uh, crowd contacts and people sort of. I remember his restaurant was on the corner. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it didn't last that long. I think it evolved into something else. He t sold it to somebody. Um, uh -huh. Oh, I was saying he, he swam at, at Mirror Beach. He swam at the Little Beach uh, every Sunday when he'd go there. And, and uh, he did uh, not, you know, there's uh, people uh, do the Dipsy Run, you know, up yeah. Mount Tam and down the other side. Really? He was a little guy. He, he, Donnie did the double Dipsies. Yeah. Wiry, strong. Uh, he was also raised by a uh, gangster, his uncle. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he talked about it in an interview I did with him. And then he gets hold of me later and says, you know, I mean, sister's mad, you know, they're, they're, her kids are reading these things about me. Uh, and <laughs> so I had to take some of it out. Uh, huh. Yeah, I think he, he was raised by uh, by uh, a guy and in, in, uh, somehow involved with the mafia in, uh, in Florida. Uh, uh, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we've known some interesting characters along the way there. Definitely. Man.
Definitely. It used to be so many characters. What? It was just an overflow of far out people. And um, hey, you, did you ever know Ruvain Ben Human? Oh, the Israeli guy. Um, I remember Alan would talk about him. I don't think I really knew him. He's not Israeli. He's from New York. Are you sure? Ruvain. Well, if he's well, he was a Jewish guy, right? He's very Jewish. Um, oh, I, I don't know what, what popped into my mind so it was some sort of Israeli connection. Uh, so I don't know. Well, we did have Kibbutz team coming to Green Gulch. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, Ruvain has been for years, maybe 10 years, in a, in a, in a Theravadan monastery in uh, Australia, out near Perth. Oh, really? And uh, wow. I was just communicating with his daughter, who's a nun there. She's been there 10 years, too. And uh, wow. when when he's through with the, uh, they're just going into a like a three-month fall uh, retreat, you know. And when he's out of it, he's going to, he's he wants to do some podcasts with me. Well, there's a serious, there's a serious guy for you. Oh, he's got, well, just read all the stuff I got on him on com. It's enough wow. for a book. Uh, uh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that guy is far out. He's, he's crazy. He's a madman. Uh, but he has persevered with practice. He got very close to Goenka. Uh, uh, he did enormous amounts of, of serious uh you know, uh, Theravada type practice in was he in Burma or India? I mean, Goenka's in India. I don't know where he was. I, I had a good friend who was a student of Goenka too. Yeah, yeah. a lot of Goenka's really big, and the Goenka. Yeah. I've I've done uh, about five Vipassana retreats here. They're tough. Uh, I like them. Oh, but uh, Goenka retreats are basically Vipassana. Uh, yeah, uh, they're more like. Secular Vipassana or something. Uh, ah. Yeah. And, and Ravain was uh, in Taiwan for many years. Uh, professor there. He became a professor. Anyway, enough about Ravain. All right, Howie. Uh, hey, it's fun talking with you. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I, I, I'm surprised I could even talk for that long. Yeah. So, uh, all right, David. Stay yeah. in touch. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to say something. I didn't finish about George Wheelwright. When I was saying, you know, you said something about dementia. I said, no, you don't have dementia. You, you know, I, I, I believe you have some, you know, some loose wire there or something. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, George Wheelwright uh, would tell the same stories over and over. They were good, but he eventually... <laughs> Got he got uh, real dementia, and uh, when Elon and I were living in San Rafael in uh, duplex or upstairs, the woman downstairs, Roberta, she she uh, took care of George, and uh, she said he got to where he didn't remember anything or anybody. He was in his nineties. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's too bad. But um, anyway, I got uh, uh, I, I had the pleasure of getting George together with Lawrence Rockefeller at Green Gulch uh, and invited Norman to come along. And uh, uh, that was very interesting. And uh, they shared a lot. They'd both been involved in in weapons and stuff, helping the military in World War Two. Wow. And had, had a lot of stuff to share. Anyway. One more. One last high point. Person, hey, all Loring right. Palmer. Yeah. Loring. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Loring was another uh, high point person, you know, no that I, I'm glad I met, you know, got to know. Yeah. Did you have any uh, any specific memory about him? Uh, I'd have to work on that one. I'm not going to get into it now. Uh, uh -huh. Well, just... just um, you know, his calligraphy and, you know, he just had this kind of sensitivity. And Elaine uh, was the woman he was with for yeah. a while. 
Yeah. Who's become very religious Jewish and lives in Israel now. Ah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, but Loring, you know, just, just sort of like, he's just sent, uh, he was also a stoner, so I got to sort of get high with him. He, a true uh, believer. Yeah, he was just, Yeah, he really, really, um, I, I don't think he ever, yeah, ever gave up on it. But in a, in a, in, in a sort of non-indulgent way, in a sense, it was like his practice and for particular yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, Lauren was a good guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was another person that I met through the Zen people. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, there's, uh, I did extensive podcasting with him before he, right before he died. Uh, yeah. Really, yeah. really interesting stuff. And he was, he was a lot older than the rest of us, you know. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. was. He was. Incidentally, Ramana Maharshi died in 1950. Ah, uh, yeah. Hmm. He's the first. He's the Advaita Vedanta, uh, the great Advaita Vedanta teacher of the first half of the 20th century, and Nisargadatta is the great one for the second half with um, uh, Punjaji. Uh, called Papaji, but Papaji, a zillion of them are called, but he's known in the West as Papaji, Punjaji, uh, being, having an enormous influence also. Huh. But, yeah, I remember him too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Howie, thank you most All right, kindly. Uh, All right. And uh, let's see, uh, I'll try to get this up, oh, I don't know, in a week or two weeks. Helen Twerkoff's just went up yesterday. I I, I like the, the uh, thing with uh, with Maggie uh, that she uh, hears the teachings when she sleeps. Oh yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was funny. Yeah, yeah, Maggie, wonderful Maggie. Okay, take care, Howie. Thanks a lot. Okay, good night or good day. Good, bye. Yeah, good night, Howie. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye bye. All right. This has been a Cuke Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Poopa of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog and Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Mm-hmm.